Good morning. So, now topic of today's lecture is industrial relations. Can someone tell me what is industrial relations? Yes, simple. Industrial relations is concerned with the relationship between management and workers or management and employees and the role of the regulatory mechanism in resolving any industrial dispute. So, you see there are three actors here, you have the management, you have the workmen and sometimes they are represented by unions all right, or associations and the third is the government, the role. So, IR covers the following areas, collective bargaining, role of unions, management and government machinery for the resolution of industrial disputes. Now, what is the meaning of this machinery? Is there a certain machine? You feed in something and something comes out. Machinery is that is the process and procedure, right? That is what is called the machinery for resolving industrial disputes. So, you can see the philosophy here is that whenever there is a dispute, it automatically comes into the realm of the government also. It is like if you fight, there is management and union, you fight, the matter is not limited to you, it goes to the government also, they come into the picture. Why? You may well tell me that, sir, why government should come in? This is a matter between the management and union of our company, why should government come in? Tell me why they should come in. Government is for the people, finally, both management and the union they are all part of the community, the citizenry, is not it. Also, what this company does, that is your company does, may be affecting a large number of people. Say, you are producing, you are a refinery producing gasoline and other fuels on which many other industries run. Kerosene is used by people. So, a large number of people are going to be affected. So, the government always has a role and they will come in. Okay. Then, apart from collective grievances, you have the individual grievance and disciplinary policy and procedure. Because in any undertaking, there will be two types of grievance, collective as well as individual. Then, labor legislation and industrial relations training. So, all these six items, we say will cover the basic topic of industrial relations. So, IR in short for industrial relations is the key to productivity increases in industrial establishments. Why? Simple, because if people are unhappy, dissatisfied, fighting among themselves, conflict is rampant, obviously what will suffer is productivity and the reverse is true. IR protects the workers interests and improves their economic conditions. Any questions? Is obvious. IR protects the rights of managers too and regulating employees' behavior and regulates the employees' behavior and prescribes punishments. from the agreed code of discipline and work norms. So, what is the code of discipline? Every establishment normally will have what they call a code of discipline. Do you have a code of discipline here in IIT? Yes, do you know? No one knows here. So, that does it mean we do not have a code of discipline or you have not made it your business to learn about it? It may be unwritten. But when you enroll, do you get any documentation which is given to you when you enroll? Huh? You get any books, something about the hall, do you get a book about the hall and the rules and regulations of staying in the hall is given there? So, that is a code of discipline, is it not? You cannot leave the station without taking permission of warden, is written there, that is a code of discipline. 
and there are various other things about timings to be observed, cleanliness, hours and so on and so forth. So, this is the code of discipline in this establishment. Similarly, other industrial undertakings have their code of discipline. Sometimes you call it standing orders, we call it standing orders and you have something called model standing orders. If you do not have your own standing order, the government has got some standing order for establishment. So, you can say that we will adopt the government standing order, this is a model standing order. All right. So, approaches to IR, let us look at the philosophy again, we talked of the philosophy when we talk of safety, health and environment, here also starts with the basic top management philosophy. So, one is unitary approach and the other is pluralistic approach. Now, we have looked at this when we talked of human resource management, remember that lecture on the scope of HRM, scope and nature of HRM, there we talked of the PM that is personnel management and the HRM that is the human resource management, we remember and we said there are number of distinguishing features between these two philosophies. And one of the most important is unitary approach, that is mutual cooperation, individual treatment, teamwork and shared goals, direct negotiation with employees themselves. That means, unitarist approach is the management looks at each individual and does not look at collective groups of people as a constituency and that is pluralistic approach, organizations as coalitions of competing interests. You have the management side who has his own interest and we have the daily rated union, you have the monthly rated employee, these are all constituent groups with their own interest. And if you remember when we did human behavior topic, all right, coalition, you remember the word coalition, coalition is a group, it is an interest group, it is bound to a, together by a common interest. If that interest disappears, the group disappears, that is a coalition. We remembered, we learnt that, remember cliques, coalitions. So, these coalition of competing interests, where management's role is to mediate amongst the different interest groups. That is the philosophy of pluralistic approach. Look at collectives, not at individuals. Trade unions as legitimate representatives of employee interests. So, pluralistic approach says state unionism is a constituency, say supervisors, they have their association let us say and the association is registered under trade union act. Management says we acknowledge that that is a constitutional constituency, which we will recognize and we will deal with them in collective bargaining. But HRM, it says it is not necessary because unitary approach says they are all our employees, each one of them. They may be in unionized constituency, supervisory constituency, management constituency, that does not matter to us. Our philosophy is each one of the employees is our employee. Now, what is the fallout from this philosophy? Fallout is we do not require constituencies at all, we do not require trade unions, we do not require any association. Why? Because management will look after you, you do not have to go anywhere else. So, that is the difference. Any questions? All right. Then stability in IR as a product of concessions and compromises between managements and unions. This is a pluralistic approach. Constituencies, they say we are having stable industrial relations. Okay. Why? Because the concessions and compromises, we do bargaining, negotiation between management and unions and that is the role, that is that approach and philosophy. Unions balance the powers between the management and the employees. Conflict is inevitable in all organizations. So, the role is to balance and keep equilibrium, this is the philosophy. So, modern philosophy is going veering away from that, modern philosophy is 
that you have to tap the hidden potential of each of your individual employees as a management. And therefore, you do not depend on unions, you do not depend on associations or any other constituency, you have to directly look after your employees. This is the approach which is a modern approach. Then you have the Marxist approach, conflict between managers and workers is inevitable, but is a product of capitalist society. This is a ideology propounded by Karl Marx, this is a Marxist philosophy. Trade unions are seen as labor's reaction to exploitation by capital. Capital here means the capitalists, those who have got the money, in short the management or the owners, you know, who make that factory, they are called capital and they exploit the workers. They give as minimum as possible to the workers and extract maximum, that is exploitation. So, therefore, trade unions are seen in this philosophy as a reaction, as a response to this exploitation and therefore, as a weapon to bring about revolutionary social change, that is a philosophy. Okay. Then industrial relations therefore, is a complex interrelation system among the following constituencies, employees, employers and government, what we have said earlier. Employees view IR as a vehicle for redressing grievances by one to one or collective actions. What does this mean? You as an employee, you join a trade union, is not it? By joining what do you do? You have certain rights, privileges and you also have some certain liabilities and responsibilities. One is you have to pay a subscription to them, right? Second is as and when the union on your behalf enters into a collective bargaining resulting in a settlement and you get lot of money out of that, increased money, a part of that increased money you have to give to the union as a fee. So, these are some of the obligations. You have to maintain the code which the union tells you to maintain also. So, these are some of the obligations, but what are the rights? Rights is if you have a grievance as an employee, you can go to the union and the union is bound to represent to the management on your behalf. Okay, that is the right that you have. So, employees therefore, view that it is a protective shield, so to say, which the union provides to them against, let us say, exploitation by the management or injustices by the management. So, securing better terms and conditions for employment, getting better status for the workers in the workplace, fostering democratic mode of decision making at various levels. You have heard of workers participation in management. There was a time during the 70s when the government felt that workers should participate not only at the grassroot level that is on the factory floor, but also at the topmost level that is the board of directors should have representatives from the workers. Okay. That concept is not that popular now because experimentation showed that there was a kind of divided loyalty. If you have a workman who has become a board member of the board of directors, there is a lack of clarity in the role. When he sits on the board, he is supposed to be management, but he is not management, he is a worker. So, is he therefore, to sit on the board as a union member trying to secure at the highest level rights for workers? or not or is he supposed to be like any other director on the board, which is looking after the overall welfare of the company, all stakeholders, not only the employee stakeholders. So, there was a confusion and lack of clarity and probably for that reason, this concept you see did not take hold. But every workman and every employee wishes in some form or the other may not be at the board level, to have, but at whatever level to have some say in the workings of the organization in which he or she is working. 
and trade union is one of the ways in which to ensure that fostering democratic mode of decision making. Employers must see IR in the following terms, creating and sustaining employee motivation, ensuring commitment from employees, achieving higher levels of efficiency, negotiating terms and conditions of employment. Any questions here? If you are a manager, plant manager, what this is saying is you are an employer in that sense and you must view IR in this positive fashion, not as something which is a waste of your time. You are an engineer, you are a technical person, so you rather be doing technical work and not IR. That is not a right thing because as plant manager, this is very much a part and parcel of your work and you must look at it positively like creating and sustaining the motivation, ensuring commitment, achieving higher levels of productivity, negotiating terms and conditions of employment. Any questions? Sharing the decision making with the employee, this is a tough one. Does any one of us like to share power? Who wants like to share power? You have power by fact that you are a manager of this department or of this factory. Most of us do not take too kindly to sharing the power. We like to have all the power on our own. Government's role today is seen as interventionist. That means normally if things are all right, they do not have a role. If things are not all right, they have a role. They intervene as a moderator, facilitator and sometimes as an enforcer of peace and harmony in the industry. So, they have all these roles as an intervention role. Then a regular role is to usher good practices in employer. That means, it is a more a passive role. They would like good practices in the employer employee relations through legislation, judicial means, judicial means by judgments which come in case of disputes which go to court and enforcement. So, this is a regular maintenance process. So, every state has got okay, a commissioner who is a labor commissioner and then you have the inspectorate of factories in which you have the chief inspector of factory, they are the enforcing arm. That means, all the laws that are there, labor laws, they are the people to enforce. Then you have got labor courts, that is the judicial part, this is the executive part, judicial part is there, labor courts. So, litigation in terms of labor disputes, they go to the judicial courts and then whatever is the judgment of the court has to be enforced. So, the whole machinery is in place to see that IR all right, is going on in a proper manner. You as a management, how do you develop good industrial relations? Now, I am saying develop. Develop means that it is not a one off thing. Develop means it is a continuing thing because people change, unions change. So, you have to keep on developing, it is a continuous process. And we talk of IR, industrial relations. So, relationships are something which when developed cannot be put on a shelf you have to keep on nurturing it, isn't it? People change, conditions change and therefore, the relationships will have to be continually nurtured. So, it is a relationship, full time job, painstaking and sustained efforts are therefore, necessary in order to develop good industrial relations, not only on side of management, but also on the side of the employees. Employees must also understand this responsibility and employees I put in bracket union. Why? Because more often than not, there has to be some sort of a collective body which has a representatives because management cannot talk to 500 or 1000 people at the same time. So, even if you do not have a registered trade union, the management may ask that why elect your representatives or select them. So, whenever we have any collective matter, 
some 10 or 15 people can come and we can discuss with them and you must see that they are representative whatever they agree with us you will abide by that agreement so the employees must also understand that then some ways some of the ways to build the good industrial relations what are they developing trust between management and labor so you are back again to human relations and human behavior isn't it you have to develop trust you have to focus on them as individual and collective human beings subject to certain types of behavior. So, you see I told you that the HR school now is concentrating more on the individual. One of the reasons is if you empathize with individual, if you build trust with them, then it helps you to manage your industrial relations and your people therefore, in a much better way. Labor and management by a, so trust by A training, B participatory working. We have seen more and more there is a tendency now for team working to come into play and many of these teams also have representatives from the union who are there on the team. So, cross functional team in many of the factories now modern factories have got union representatives also on them and C pursuing common organizational interests. What does that mean? It means that look here, you may be management, I may be union, but we are all member of the same company and this company's interest is our interest jointly. Because if company does well, both our constituencies will do well. If company does not do well, we will both think together, then where is the dispute? Then if I am union, I say my dispute is that we are doing well, but you are not sharing you know the benefits that is my dispute. Any questions? Okay. So, therefore, you have to develop trust <coughs> and this has to be done on the basis of sound democratic trade union all right which protects employees benefits and terms of employment in a fair way so you have a term which you have heard about responsible trade unionism and irresponsible trade unionism so just like you have responsible managements and irresponsible management the same is true for trade union finally it depends on the leadership that you have in both these constituencies. Maintenance of industrial peace that is established machinery for prevention and settlement of industrial disputes expeditiously. Example bipartite and tripartite committees for evolving and implementing personnel policies, code of conduct, code of discipline etcetera that is involvement of both the constituency instead of unilaterally management making all these rules involve union in it and therefore, this is one better way of maintaining industrial peace. Continuous feedback and monitoring whatever system you start the mortality rate will be high of all these systems unless you look at it again and again you monitor see if things are going right in the system that you have introduced if it is not going right analyze what is going wrong provide correction so monitoring and feedback is very ins important through institutionalized systems of committees and other forums not force So, that is institutionalization. What is institutionalization? It is not people dependent. Today, you have one plant manager, you have one trade union leader. It should not be that they have agreed to have certain committees and meetings. Even if they are not there, the next person that comes, say a joint plant committee should meet and continue to meet irrespective of who are the members of the committee or who is the chairman of the committee. 
that is institutionalization that is very important because that is where you have a forum or a platform where union and management can meet periodically have agenda bring problems which may have potential of brewing disputes and so on and resolving it before it becomes into a conflict then professional approach handle hr through skilled professional managers both line and staff what it means is those who have some expertise say you are a family company you don't put your brother or your son unless he has that expertise to do a certain work if he has that expertise by all means but if not you put people who have the knowledge skills and the expertise that is professional now there are some of the laws labor laws there are several but some of the laws which are important to us as managers for management of human resources so and um, india has enacted several laws relating to labor matters and within the framework of the international labor organization and india is a signatory to that an original signatory some of the indian labor legislations are these are some important laws on working conditions is one category that is factories act shops and establishments act mines act plantation labor act indian merchant shipping act etc then there are certain laws the classification is on the wages that is payment of wages act minimum wages act payment of bonus act equal remuneration act etc then laws on industrial relations so industrial disputes act indian trade union act industrial employment standing orders act and lastly laws on social security workers compensation act maternity benefit act employee state insurance act is to do with health all right so any questions on what we have done so far okay pardon me they are amended time to time original year and many of them have rules which are enacted there under act is very broad rules are ways of working within that act and amendments happen time to time amendments are also mentioned but the original act year is usually mentioned this is the form trade union we have talked of ir and we have seen that one of the important constituents for interrelation in this relationship is a trade union other is management third is government now trade union a continuous association of wage earners for the purpose of maintaining or improving the condition of their working lives this is one definition an association of workers in one or more occupations an association carried on mainly for the purpose of protecting and advancing the members economic interests in connection with their daily work this is another definition and there are several other definitions but essentially it is a device it's a coalition interest group which comes together for protecting their interests that's what is a trade union and these people are not millionaires they are wage earners essentially who have to work for a living so they have unity in strength because each one of them individually is not very strong not strong enough to protect his or her interest so they rely on the coalition on the strength of numbers to enforce their rights so some of the characteristics are voluntary association of workers formed to protect and promote their interests through collective bargaining that is the mode the vehicle collective bargaining so is there any other way to protect and promote your interest can you think of any other way i can think through coercion violence isn't that a way but trade unions don't do that 
they do it by collective bargaining. Such an association of workers could be temporary or permanent. Trade unions being voluntary ones, a worker has a choice to join or not to join the union. In theory, he has a choice, but in practice, does he have a choice? Hardly, really he does not have a choice, because if you have 500 people and 499 are joining, uh, you will be a brave soul if you say, look, I do not want to join the union, because you will be frightened. No? All the others are joining, if I do not join, then I will be left unprotected. So, in practice, you willy nilly become a member, unless, unless there are sizable numbers, say within that 500, 250 say we will not join, we will not join this trade union, we will join some other trade union, another 50 say we will join a third trade union. So, you have multiplicity of trade unions which also happen. But even there, remember, there are hardly any example of an employee who does not join some trade union or the other, they usually join. A trade union also has a choice to affiliate or not affiliate itself with an apex body of trade unions, federations or unions. Like you have heard of the INTUC, that is the apex body, the federation. So, many trade unions of many factories and many industries, say mining industry. We have industry type trade unions, we have enterprise type trade unions. That is the belong to Hindustan lever employees trade union. All right. Or you may have the mines, that is the industry, they have trade union on the railways. So, whatever it is, they affiliate themselves to the INTUC, let us say, or AITUC, the BMS, HMS, these are central bodies. CITU, that is the Marxist. So, these are affiliated. Why? Why do they affiliate? They have a choice to have more power, you know, unity is strength, that is why. Trade unions can be industrial union or trade or craft union, as I said, mines, shipping, port and dock workers, uh, truckers, you know, truck and so on. Affiliate is you pay a fee, you are an affiliate or an associate. And both are same, more or less, for our purpose. Essentially, that means you have a connection with them. The connection may be of various types. Associate may have got certain rights and privilege, affiliate may have certain other more or less rights and privilege. But essentially, what it means you pay a fee, and in return for that, when you have a dispute, etcetera, you will get the support of the central trade union. Okay. So, again we elaborate on it, why do workers join trade union and some of these detailed reasons are job security, wages and benefit, working conditions, fair and just supervision, huh? powerlessness need to belong. Powerlessness means as we said, if 499 join and you do not join, you feel powerless. So, you say you better join trade union, then you will feel at least secure. There are certain theories which have been developed over the years of trade unions. First is revolutionary theory, Karl Marx theory of class war, not one, and dialectical materialism. Trade unions are the prime organizing centers to streamline the forces for the working classes, instruments to overthrow capitalism, prime instruments of the class struggle between proletarian workers and capitalist businessmen. Okay. That is Marxist theory. You have the evolutionary theory, theory of industrial democracy. Trade unionism is an extension of the principle of democracy in the industrial sphere. Theory of industrial jurisprudence, workers individually fail in bargaining with the employers for protecting their interests. Trade unionism serves as a means for workers to protect them in work. 
Next, rebellion theory. Trade unionism is a spontaneous outcome in the growth of mechanization. This is a new thought because machines have come. You know, before industrial revolution, there were no trade unions. You have craftsmen, you had guilds, all right, but no trade union in the modern sense. Use of machine leads to exploitation of workers. Machines are the cause of labor movements and trade unionism and trade unionism is a rebellion approach to mechanization and automation because it dehumanizes people. So, people get together to try and fight that. You have the another theory the Gandhian approach. Mahatma Gandhi says class collaboration rather than class conflict and struggle. So, you combine and collaborate. Take from capitalists workers due share by reform and self consciousness among the workers. Uh, this led to the emergence of trade unionism. Trade unionism is not only related to material aspect, but also moral and intellectual aspects. Direct aim of trade unionism is not in the last degree political, instead is direct aim is internal reform and also evolution of internal strengths like Mahatma Gandhi used to go on fast. No? Why? To deny himself food to develop internal strengths. Trade unionism is not anti capitalistic this is the Gandhian view. Whenever you talk of trade unionism and industrial relations, the thought occurs immediately to you of disputes, is not it? Strikes, disputes. So, a dispute is any difference between the employers and the employees, or between employees and the workmen, or between workmen and workmen, which is connected with the employment or non employment or the terms of employment and conditions of employment of any person. This is as per Industrial Disputes Act definition that is an industrial dispute. So, it is very broad. Disputes differ from discipline and grievance which is focus is individual whereas, dispute focuses on collectivity of individuals all right. So, grievance which is focus for individual or discipline and collective issues are like wages benefits these are collective applicable to all workmen and the principles all right of industrial the dispute must affect a large number of workmen who have a community of interest and the rights of these workmen must be affected as a class if it is not large number we call it a discipline matter or a grievance matter of one or two workmen the dispute must be taken up either by the industry union or by a substantial number of workmen. The grievance turns from an individual complaint to a general complaint, then it becomes a dispute. There must be some nexus between union and the dispute. According to section 2 a of the industrial disputes act, a workman has a right to raise an industrial dispute, he has a right with regard to termination, discharge, dismissal or entrenchment of his or her service, even though no other workman or any trade union of workmen raises it or is a party to the dispute. That means, these are considered by the act as a very fundamental and life and death kind of issue. So, even if no union supports him, no other workman comes, he has a right to raise this okay. and this is a dispute you can raise it as an industrial dispute, go to court on it and it will be accepted by the court, it would not be dismissed as a personal grievance or something like that. Forms of industrial disputes, we have all heard of strikes which is a spontaneous and concerted withdrawal of workmen from production. Say so, today we are not working and they walk out. Primary strikes, these are aimed at the employer and include stay away strike, stay in strike that also is a strike, it is difficult to handle. 
people refuse to leave the factory, they are there. Sit down strike, pen down strike, tools down strike, go slow, work to rule, token or protest strike, cat call strike, picketing and boycott. This is should be wild cat strike, wild cat, which means what? It means without any notice, very sudden wild cat strike. Picketing or boycott, picketing is what? Not allowing people to enter, other workmen, block the gate. Boycott is do not go at all, we are not going, we are boycotting. Then you have secondary strikes, the pressure is applied not against the employer with whom the workman is having dispute, but against the third party who has good trade relations with the employer. These are also called sympathy strikes. Okay. You have heard, seen in newspapers, so and so union is going in sympathy strike, not direct strike. They are supporting from outside. Lockouts is another instrument of dispute. Temporary shutting down or closing of a place of business by the employer, this is the employer's weapon. So, lockouts are the counterpart of strikes, a weapon in the hands of the employer. Why? Because if you lock out, you do not pay wages and salaries, remember that will hurt the workmen, hence it is a weapon in the hands of the employer. Then this new phenomenon gherao, which originated in the state of West Bengal, where we are sitting now and this originated somewhere in the 60s, 1960s. This is illegal physical blockade by encirclement aimed at preventing the ingress or egress from or to a particular office or place. What does it mean? Say you gherao me, that means I will be here for 10 hours, 20 hours, 30 hours, 40 hours, I will not be allowed to leave, you will form a circle around me, you will come in relays, you know, you will go have nashta come back, someone else will be there, but I will stay here. So, that is physical duress in order to extract some concession okay, out. Then I will be cut off from telephones, I cannot call police, so this is Gerao. These are inti intimidatory tactics to get someone by coercion to agree to something, which otherwise is not agree. So, we say this is illegal, but is very difficult to prove, because if I go to court and say I was gerawed, you say, sir, I was, we were not gerawing, we are just discussing with him here. <laughs> you are having class, all right. So, picketing boycott we have looked at and I will just show you collective bargaining definition is a process by which employers on the one hand and representatives of the employees on the other hand attempt to arrive at agreements covering the conditions under which the employees will contribute and be compensated for their services. Okay. And both the employer and the employees act collectively and the process of reaching an agreement involves proposals and counter proposals, offers and counter offers till an agreement is reached. So, this is just in nutshell about industrial relations. And next lecture, we will